Ну что, мы прибыли в Шанхай. We've arrived in Shanghai. Here's our team. Настя. Макс. And we'll start our new adventure in China. With tea. That's the only thing you can start a Chinese adventure with. We're on a layover to Xiamen. We're planning a big trip around Fujian and Guangdong. Maybe we'll visit Jiangxi province as well. The purpose of our trip is finding new tea and teaware as usual. We've got some important meetings arranged. We'll keep moving. Our arrival in Xiamen started with losing one of our suitcases. We'll try to find it. It went somewhere this way. My favorite thing about adventures is that no matter how good your plans, they always get changed by what happens to you. What happened to us? One of our suitcases was kept in Shanghai. They found something like a battery in it. It's forbidden. We don't know how it got there. You can take batteries as hand luggage only. They gave us a special paper and told us that it could arrive today or the next day. So we had to stay in Xiamen for one more day. We didn't expect it. But we have to wait. This suitcase contains our tripods and other important stuff. We decided to have lunch now and probably we'll go to a tea club in the evening to delve deeper into Chinese tea culture. It's warm, about 20 degrees. We're in a good mood, even though we spent one day on the road. How are you? I'm good. It's good to feel good. Here you can see a classical Asian story. They grow climbing plants in places like this. It's very beautiful. This is Guanyin Temple. I've never been here because I rarely visit cities. But anyway, we're staying in Xiamen, so we decided to visit this place. There's a vegetarian restaurant nearby, where you can find delicious food which is only 30 yuan per person. So that's exactly what we're going to do. This is a traditional Chinese canteen. There are many people here. Several thousand people come here during the day, our friend said. It's evening now, so there's not so many people here. There was even a spare parking space. And all these people don't eat meat. That's the answer to the question, are there many vegetarians in China? Well, yes, there's a lot of them here. I've never seen a place as big as this. The choice of food is great. They have many fresh foods, just the way I like it. It's cool. It's a cool place. It's called a restaurant and not a cafe or a canteen because the choice is so huge. Fujian cuisine, mushrooms, tofu, fried vegetables, noodles, different green herbs, potatoes, sweets, fruits, pomelo and watermelons, berries, and many other delicious things. So you can have a really good and cheap meal here. And people from all over the district come here to eat. This is the biggest vegetarian restaurant I've ever seen. I've never been to Xiamen before. But I remember this place. It's cool. You can find this place too. It's located near Guanyin Monastery. It's not difficult to find. It's easy. We're inside the monastery. There's a beautiful 1,000 hand Guanyin statue. It's carved from wood. There exists a Buddhist tradition. Every family has its own small statue. In the Russian Orthodox tradition, they light candles. And here they have small statues instead. There are hundreds and thousands of little statues in the monastery. 
Placing one statue for a year costs 1,200 yuan, two years 3,200, five years 5,000, and ten years 10,000. They believe that having a statue here brings luck, wealth and happiness to your family. This temple is very popular in Fujian. And south of Fujian province is really a Buddhist region. Xiamen is really close to Taiwan. So there are many Taiwanese goods, traditions and works of art here. And moreover, they speak the same dialect here. Even in the temples, modern technology is used. Even in a Buddhist temple. This has got a motor. These prayer wheels are supposed to be turned by hand. And it's got a film here. You can't see it because it's on the phone. Sign of the times. It's a small vespiri. Be careful. This is a famous stone carving technique. It's well known in Taiwan. Some parts are just polished by visitors' hands. It's a beautiful temple. It has a smaller Kuan Yin statue. This whole temple is a bit smaller. In Taiwan, you feel different in temples like this one. These temples are new. They were built after the Cultural Revolution and restored later. <laughs> this is interesting. On this donation box you can pay by credit card using a QR code. We decided to go to a tea club in the evening, one of Xiamen's tea culture centers. They'll make us tea the traditional way. It's interesting to explore new aspects of tea culture. We'll show you what these tea clubs look like. There are many of them. This is not the oldest one. It's located in a very beautiful place in a park near a river, Great Feng Shui. I'll show you this tea house and I hope that we'll see more. Hello my friends, we've come to a tea club, we've chosen the tea. We wanted to show you what a traditional tea house looks like, their proper brewing method. This lady is the tea master. In Xiamen, as you can see, they prefer dry tea ceremony, with no tea tray used. This wood is very old. This furniture is made out of really old trees. We decided to choose high mountain teas. Taking part in this ceremony costs about $48, a bit less than 300 yuan. And for tea, for 8 grams, you'll pay about 30 yuan, or $5. We'll taste Shui Zhang tea. Let's see what they've got. It's always interesting to find out what tea they have in their assortment. I asked, and they said that they had everything. But we found out that what they meant was, they have white tea, some high mountain teas, pu'er, and what else? Well, nothing more. Just white tea, high mountain tea, da hong pao, and shui zhang zhu gui. Six or seven sorts in total. That's the whole assortment of the tea club. I've always said that Russian tea clubs are really special. The assortment is much wider than in Chinese clubs. Anyway, it's interesting to see how they brew. They gave us some handmade sweets. They make them twice a week. Here, try one. We'll see what they're like with tea. They offer them to guests during the ceremony. The smell is very nice. It's just a Taiwanese tradition. 
Fujian and Taiwan are very close in terms of traditions. Their culture is close. Originally, people from Fujian moved to Taiwan. That's why you can find many Taiwanese traditions here, and vice versa. It's interesting to taste it. Their company sells tea. They have a small shop and tea club here. This format reminds me of ours. The only difference is this room is much bigger. And in the shop, some teas are packed in beautiful big packaging, but it's very expensive. It looks beautiful, but the choice is not that big. It's very different, not like what we're used to. I asked them if they have a tea school here, and she said that they do. The owner is the main master, and he's also the teacher in the school. He comes from Changzhou. Changzhou. It's a city in Fujian province, to the north of Xiamen. It's pretty big too. It's even closer to Angxi. It's interesting, they still drink local tea. If you go to a tea club in Fujian, they'll have tea from Fujian. <laughs> if you visit a tea club in some other area, for example, when we went to Chengdu, we were drinking high mountain teas. They prefer oolong teas, especially for tea ceremonies. I'd like to visit a couple of other tea clubs and compare them. It seems that we have Zhu Gui, not Shui Zhang. She said that Shui Zhang is usually made King Huo style or low fire, and Zhu Gui is roasted more intensively. This tea is not very roasted, it's very gentle. Anyway, it's good. Not the highest grade. We tasted some Zhu Gui tea. The price was 300 yuan. We had just three or four brews, but that's all we can get out of it. It's pretty simple. I think that it's cheaper than $16 for 100 grams. I asked her to bring aged raw pu'er. She said that they have it in their collection. The company has about 200 varieties of tea, and in the tea house they have 100. I asked her if they have a full list. She said no, they used to have one, but they don't use it anymore. It's another tradition. They also don't show you the tea leaves. They just show the bag. That's just how they do it here. Smelling dry leaves before buying is more about tea markets or specialized tea shops. We've paid and asked them a lot of questions about their way of presentation. Here we see all the kinds of teaware that they use. Gaiwan, special trays, a cloth, little plates for cups, just like in Taiwan. A long table, an electric kettle, but sometimes they use other kettles. Hello? Oh, what's that you got there? Oh, here we have a 1999 pu'er from Czech Thai factory. I think it will taste like a pu'er we had a long time ago in our collection. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> this lady is the owner. They understood that we have serious ambitions and were asking serious questions. Let's see. We can see that it was broken carefully, it's aged wild grown, so the leaves are very clean, with a big stick right in the middle of the cake. Let's taste it. I've not tried this tea, only from 2001. This cake is sold here for $613, or 3,800 yuan. Usually people are interested in the price of tea in China, so here it is. 3,800 yuan per one cake of aged pu'er. That's similar to our prices. We sell aged Taiwanese for 400, 500, 600 dollars per cake. So the prices here in China and at home are almost the same. <laughs> Serious business. A bit of advertising. Let's taste it. It's my first time. 
And the biscuit is classical. It has a bit of matcha added with some sort of fruit jam inside. I said that she can use eight grams for the ceremony. It's okay, we like strong tea, especially now after the road. Drinking tea and having a sleepless night is a good idea because we have to wait for our luggage's return anyway. It's very beautiful here. They have a huge glass window and there's a river nearby with a small road and a bamboo fence. This tea house is relatively simple in comparison with what we saw in Chengdu. The floor's falling apart and there's a big part missing. The walls look old too. We see that they ignored some details and paid great attention to others. The next time we choose a tea club, we'll think about it in advance and pay more attention, try to find something better. We like to find the best places. With nice visuals. One brew of this tea costs $14. Just one brew. You pay for the place. We paid 300 yuan or 48 dollars for sitting here. And then we pay for the tea. We pay an additional 5 dollars for the second ceremony. 16 dollars for 6 grams of the tea. I hope that it's good. What's interesting, speaking about the education, I started asking the tea master more difficult questions and she didn't answer. She said that this tea has no mold smell. She said that it's a properly aged Lao Cha. Dry storage. It's believed to be the best storage option all over China. She said that they age their teas in a dry place. It's the best way. She was talking about their storage. It's good that she came. She understood that we're asking serious questions and it would be great to get detailed answers. She says that their company owns many factories and it stores tea in Beijing and here. They don't keep the tea in Beijing, it's too dry there. It's like aging tea in Moscow or Sochi. And anyway, they brought the tea from Beijing here. It ages quicker. It's better here. Beijing storage is too dry. She said that the liquor has a bright and clean color. It shows that the aging conditions were good. Ripe pu'er becomes brighter with age, and raw pu'er becomes darker with age. Many people from the tea industry already know that. She's very well educated. I asked her where it's best to store the tea. She said that if you're choosing between three places in Yunnan, Lingkang, Menghai and Kunming, that Lingkang is best, in her experience. It's not too hot and humid like in Menghai, and it's not too dry like in Kunming, if I got it right. Lingkang storage seems to be perfect for aging. I felt it judging by one of our ripe pu'ers from Mengku, a region in Lingkang. Do you remember? We had Mengku Lao Shu Cha Tu. It was really great. It was aged in Lingkang. And the tea from Menghai was a bit different. It had this beetroot note in it. It appears because of the high humidity in Menghai. That's one of the reasons why we visit small clubs like this one, to get knowledge. Every tea lover has their own experience and observations. And tea factories and shop owners can have no knowledge about the culture, only about production. So visiting tea clubs can be interesting, because we can find out many details about this culture, even if they just confirm what you already know. I've been to Cheng Tai factory. It's close to Pur. They have many other factories, one of which is in Yiwu. That's where this tea was produced. The tea is not bad, but not outstanding, I would say. It tastes like Cheng Tai tea that we had. Taiwanese raw pu'er is better, in my opinion. They have a rich taste. Cheng Tai tea is just normal aged raw pu'er. It really tastes like the ones we had. Cheng Tai. Angora. 
This is only the second time in their lives that they saw a foreigner who knows something about tea. They say they have customers from abroad, from Singapore, Philippines, Hong Kong, Korea and Japan. They're all from Asia. Usually they don't come from other parts of the world, just close neighbors. And most of them are Chinese, who live in Hong Kong or Singapore. She said that the first foreigner who knew a lot about tea was from Korea. And that I'm the first European. Giving beautiful clothes to the master is very important. We're in a tea club. We want the master to wear beautiful clothes and not to use the cell phone. Can you imagine something like that happening in our club if a tea master answered a phone call during a ceremony? It means that it's a bit of a different format, like in a shop. You shouldn't behave like that in a tea club. In a shop, when you don't pay for drinking tea, you're free to do anything you like. But when you're paying for the tea ceremony, it's unacceptable. My friends, if someone from our staff sees this, please don't behave like that. She said that they don't trust unknown companies, so they decided to do everything on their own. She asked what kind of sweets we have in our clubs. And I said we only have dry fruits and candy bars. We're advocating the idea that you shouldn't eat during tea ceremony, maybe just in between teas. Raw pur is a strong and good tea, just like ripe pur. You can't spoil the experience by eating something sweet. And if we were drinking some exquisite yellow tea, it would destroy everything. These sweets are not too sweet though, very nice. When we went to Tiang Fu shop, I saw these sweets there, I've even bought some. We even have a video when we were driving with our friend from Guangxi to Fujian, through Hunan, and there we went to the shop. She said that they started brewing dry style in 2011-2012. The shop is seven years old, and before that they had another shop. Back then they used tea trays, even in the 80s. They made little round tables. They were the size of porcelain tea trays. They fitted one guy one and four cups, and they can be put inside the table. These were the tea sets they had. And then, in the 90s, when Taiwanese tradition came closer, they started changing. Shui Ji appeared. These Taiwanese tea boats. She said that they saw this tree when they were picking leaves. They asked the pickers to wash it and send it here. It turned out to be quite expensive. But she likes the history of the piece. Tea lovers like things that have their own history. I asked about people who come to the club. She said that drinking tea is a popular hobby in Xiamen. Most of them are older than 30. She said that young people who come here to drink tea are ready to pay big money. Tea that costs some thousand yuan per gin. That's about $140 for 100 grams. So young people who come here know little about expensive teas, and it's necessary to teach them. Unfortunately, they prefer drinking alcohol. But older people prefer drinking tea, and there are many more of them here. She said that when the tea becomes weaker, it starts tasting sweet. I asked her where their factories are located and what manufacturers they work with. I don't know if it's true, but it seems they only have one factory. In the whole world now, it seems to be getting very fashionable to develop agricultural tourism. She says that their company works with about 300 small shops in Xiamen and other cities. And she says that it's necessary to send their staff and clients somewhere to have a break. And they invented a new format. 
that became popular in Yunnan and other regions. A hotel with a small tea school. There you can see how tea leaves are picked and processed. You can try making your own tea. And you can eat and sleep in the same place. A sort of cultural center in the mountains. It's a sort of agritourism with a small village and mountains nearby. There are many places like this in China. It's a very good format for business because owning a factory is not always worth it if you sell your tea in your own shop. In this case, it's better to cooperate with other manufacturers, as we did in Jinggu. But we don't own this place. We understand that it's much more profitable to buy raw leaves and produce tea in collaboration with other producers. It makes you more independent. You don't have to pay rent and taxes. That's why, she said, they decided to introduce this new tourism format. It's interesting. She said that when some businessmen come here to have a conversation, the tea master brews for them. I asked her if guests prefer to make their own tea. She said that if it's a date, people prefer brewing their own tea. And if it's an official event, they ask the tea master to make tea. It all depends on the guests themselves. Most of the guests know a lot about tea and don't ask a lot of questions. They just enjoy the tea and have conversations. If a new sort of tea appears, they invite their old customers to try it and introduce these teas. Or if the guests don't talk a lot, the master starts talking about the tea they're drinking. It helps to start a good conversation. She answers their questions. But in most cases, they don't go deep into conversation about tea. They just come here to drink tea. Most of their guests know something about tea and don't want to know more. They don't ask questions about production and technological processes. This is a specific subculture. In China, everything has a greater scale compared to our tea subculture. But the average Chinese person won't answer questions about tea, even simple ones. I don't think they'll know things like type of poor tea, how it's fermented, or where the tea is made, or the types of trees and processing details. I think that most of them wouldn't answer these questions. Well, it's obvious. She chooses fresh poor teas every spring from about 24 different villages in Yunnan. She says that they prefer drinking Lao Cha, but they also like fresh Gu Shu raw poor teas. They're of great value. And usually they don't offer these teas to guests. It's a typical Chinese story. I made a mistake. I didn't tell her that we specialize in tea. Though otherwise they wouldn't have given us this boring Wu Yishan tea. Chinese have a word. I'm not going to pronounce it now. It means wasting good tea for an unworthy person. It's like preaching to deaf ears. They don't want to offend their guest. Basically, they give tea that their guest wants and will understand and appreciate. If he doesn't understand it, they'll just brew a cheaper one. If the guest doesn't need a tea like that. They always look at the expertise of their guests. And she drinks teas that they don't even sell. Tastes have many nuances. They organize poor contests where teas from many families from a region compete with each other. Places like Laobanjang and Yiwu. Yiwu factory was one of the best. There are some rare teas that are produced from only about 30 or 40 trees. They produce only 40 or 50 extremely expensive tea cakes, like in Taiwan. I've seen this in Yunnan as well, but I don't think it's worth it, because these contest teas are much more expensive. 
and they really aren't worth the price. For example, recently in Angshi, 50 grams of tea was sold for 50,000 yuan, which is $7,000. We're lucky to meet her, she knows a lot about poor tea. She says that she's been to more than a hundred mountain villages where tea is picked and processed. And someone from her company has been to more than 300 mountains when they were choosing villages from which to get teas. She's very practical in terms of assessment. She looks at the taste, aroma. She's interested in the taste of wild-grown teas. This lady receives tea samples from many villages, tastes them, just like we do. She tastes them and chooses. And every year they produce some special and exclusive teas for their personal use. Like many respectable poor specialists, they've made a book. These are all their suppliers, raw poor producers. This book is about poor tea and villages where it's produced. They've been buying tea and collaborating with them for many years. Their approach is very professional. There aren't many tea clubs in China that do that. Only those that deal with selling teas. It's interesting, they show the growth of the price from 8 yuan in 2000 to 1,800 yuan in 2018. Price growth is just huge. Tea from every village, every mountain has its value. I think this book was published in 2018. So they show the price range only from 2000 to 2018. Really expensive. The price for wild raw poor is growing at an incredible speed. Buying wild grown raw poor can be a great investment. Well, I'd like to say that this book is pretty good. I've already seen tables like these about white tea prices. I went to Songji, near Zhenge. It's a place where white tea is produced. And the prices for tea haven't changed in six years. Well, it's true that some teas became more expensive, but it's a pretty narrow field. If you go to unpopular villages of the region, you can find tea leaves of good quality, but for a lower price, like in Yongdae or Neilao. They sell this book for 118 yuan. That's a thousand rubles or eighteen dollars. This book is more about technological characteristics of tea, about villages and their geography, their heights above sea level, population, average temperature, and about the price growth in this or that place. Well, tea price growth is a pretty uncertain thing. The most incredible price growth is from 5 yuan in 2000 to 22,000 yuan in 2017. I like that price growth. I asked about her personal favorite pu'er. She said it's Naka tea. It's very popular. Naka is a wonderful village. We have to buy some tea from there this year. We went there last year and tried some teas, but many of them had already been bought. I added her to our VIP chat. It's an interesting invention. They use these little roasting machines. We bought some of them for our clubs. They put small leaf stems here, oolong, probably tea guanyin, and they use it instead of incense to spread a pleasant aroma. 
And these leaves, particles, produce an extremely pleasant tea aroma. I think we'll have to try this in one of our clubs. We had a cultural program planned for tonight. It's always necessary to have one when visiting a city. So here we are walking on Xiamen Beach. It's a small camp where people sleep. And it's a pity that we didn't bring our tents instead of renting a room. We could have slept here after a special registration. Everything's free. Well, it's a bit noisy here. But anyway, it's a good option. Take off your shoes and sleep. High tech. Singing songs in the evening is a peculiar element of Chinese culture. They also have a thing like KTV or karaoke TV. Somebody's always singing. The surprising thing about it is that nobody cares about having a bad voice or not knowing how to sing. They sing anyway. You can just come and sing horribly too, and nobody will pay attention. It's good for people in China. All Chinese want to express themselves in any way possible, and nobody will hate them for that. It's really cool. Their immediacy is just wonderful sometimes. There are many young people here. I guess when a guy and his girlfriend have no place to spend a night together, they just come here. I guess we have to go to sleep. It's 10 p.m. and it was a long day. Tomorrow we'll find our suitcase and it will be a new day. Bye-bye.